Hallelujah. 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 Thanks be unto God who is so merciful and gracious unto us that he has blessed us just one more day to see another day. And that in and of itself is enough to give God glory. It's enough to give God praise. It's enough for you to make a decision right now within yourself to decide for the rest of my days, I'm going to follow Jesus because he has been so good to me. I want to thank all of you that have tuned in here tonight uh, for this second night of revival, the Jesus that we know revival. We had a great kickoff on last night with Pastor Lee B. Walker from the New Home Missionary Baptist Church there in Montgomery, Alabama. And man, he just threw the thing out the roof. He did an awesome job. Thank you, brother, for your love and for your labor for the Lord. And I pray that he will grant you riches and mercy for the rest of your days. And and I, I'm here tonight, but I got to get out of the way because this week is going to be a good week. We got some great men, some great men of God that I believe that have something to say during this time for the people of God. So again, I'm thankful for everybody that is tuned in here tonight. And I ask that as you're tuning in, if you would go ahead and share this video, if you would go ahead and react to this video and amen, we're going to get into the word of the Lord here um, on tonight. The, the text that I assigned for myself here tonight is the true vine, the true vine. So, 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 so first, as we come to the 15th chapter of John, like anywhere else in the Bible, we are listening to God. And the writer here is the Apostle John, but the writer is also God, the Holy Spirit who is inspiring every word that John is writing. Because of this, the Bible in that fact is without error. The Bible is accurate. The Bible does not need any type of modifications. The Bible is authoritative. When the Bible speaks, God speaks. And when God speaks, we listen because God says to us what we must know. And the Bible should dominate every life and all of human society. For in it is contained all necessary truth for life in this time and for eternal life. And when a nation or a person rejects the Bible, they have rejected God. And the consequences of that are dying. But they have rejected the word of God. Those who listen to God through his word are given life and they are given blessings is now and forevermore. And so we come here to the 15th chapter of John just to set the stage here just a little bit starting in chapter number 13 and running to chapter 16. We find ourselves on a Thursday night of what we know as Passion Week and the last week of our Lord's ministry and Thursday night was an important night and he gathered with the 12 disciples to celebrate the Passover on that Thursday night when the Galilean Jews were celebrated and they met together in a kind of secret place that we call an upper room and, and, and our Lord spent that night telling them many wonderful things and giving them many wonderful promises and as that night moved on our, our Lord exposed Judas as a traitor. He exposed Judas as a traitor and he dismissed him and, and, and Judas is gone and only the 11 are left and they are true disciples. But as we come to chapter 15, they're no longer in the upper room. They're no longer there. They have left the upper room. It is deep into the dark of the night. But chapter 14 ends with Jesus saying this, get up. And let us go from here. And apparently at that time they had left the upper room and Jesus and the other 11 and they began their walk through Jerusalem and headed out to the east side of the city to a garden where our Lord would pray in prayer so agonizing that he would sweat as if there were great drops of blood. And, and while he was praying they would fall asleep and, and into the garden later would come Judas and the Roman soldiers and, and the Jewish leaders to arrest him and there Judas would kiss him the betrayal would take place and the next day our master would be crucified and as they left the upper room and they walked through the darkness of Jerusalem our, our Lord continues to speak to them man. and what he says to them is recorded in chapters 15 and 16 and of course all these things that he says nothing is more definitive than the first eight verses of chapter 15 
Listen to what he says. I'm going to read for you the John chapter 15 verses 1 through 8. I know some of y'all was waiting on me to read the scripture, how the man going to preach, and he ain't going to read the scripture. I got your scripture. John chapter 15 verses 1 through 8. He said, I am the vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the world which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I abide in you as the branch cannot bear fruit in and of itself unless it abides in the vines. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and ye are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him he bears much fruit for apart from me you can do nothing if anyone gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned if you abide in in me and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you will and it will be done for you. My disciples, my father is glorified by this that you bear much fruit and so prove yourselves to be my disciples. Now it should be very obvious from the final sentence that the point of the analogy is this. This is about a vine and branches and fruit bearing that proves someone is a true disciple of Christ. This then is about the nature of genuine salvation. This is about the nature of genuine salvation. This is a concern to our Lord, a concern to all the Bible writers and a concern to all the faithful Christians and has been throughout history. How does one know that one is a true disciple? How does one know that one is genuinely on their way to heaven? How does one know that he or she will escape the grips of hell? How do we know nothing is more important than this? Nothing is more important than salvation. Nothing is more important than eternal life. Nothing is more important than heaven. How do you know in this picture that the Lord paints for us? We receive everything that we need to know. But before we look at the nature of his salvation, just a reminder, there's also in these verses that I read to you statements that point to the nature of Christ. Before we get to the nature of salvation, the essential reality of salvation, we have to acknowledge the nature of Christ. The essential reality of Christ, the divine nature of the Lord Jesus Christ is declared here in verse 1. He said, I am the vine. He says, and in verse 5 again, he says, I am the vine. How is this a claim to deity? Because of the verb, I am. Back in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses came before God in the wilderness and asked him his name, God said, my name is I am that I am. That's tetragrammaton. That, that, that is the, the eternally existent one. That is the one of everything, the everlasting being, the always is and the always was and the always will be. Theologians call it the aseity of God, the eternal being of God. He is the I am throughout his preaching, throughout his teaching, throughout his healing, throughout his disciples' ministry. Jesus continually declared that he is God. He said things like, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. In a context of discussion about the Sabbath, he reminds them that the Sabbath does not apply to God. The Sabbath does not apply to God because God is at work all the time. And the Sabbath doesn't really apply to me either because I, like God, am at work all the time. They were infuriated that he would make such a claim that was in chapter 5 of John's gospel. Later on in chapter number 8, Jesus said, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me of whom you say he is our God and therefore if God who is your God glorifies me as God you ought to also glorify me and again they were offended at such a, a perceived blasphemy in chapter 10 of John's gospel he even said it more concisely he said I and the father are one one, one in nature 
One in essence. In, in that same chapter, chapter 10 and verse number 18, he said, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know that the Father is in me and I am also in the Father. All throughout his life and ministry, he claimed that he is God. Every time Jesus said, my Father, he had the same nature as God. And his Jewish audience they understood exactly what he was saying, which is why they had such a problem with him. In fact, in chapter 5 of John's gospel, verse number 18, this is what it read. It said, for this cause, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was also calling God his own father, making himself of somewhat an equal to God. They understood that is exactly what he was doing. And one of the ways that he did that was by taking himself the name of God. I am. And applying it to himself. There, there's a series of those claims throughout the gospel of John. He said, I am the bread of life. He said, I am the living bread that come down from heaven. He said, I am the light of the world. He said, I am the door. I am the shepherd. He said, I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he makes the stunning, inescapable claim. Chapter 8 and verse number 58. Before Abraham was born, I am eternally existing. Jesus is none other than the great I am. I am the eternal God in human flesh. It is important to believe, listen to this, John chapter 8 and verse number 24. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sin. The Jews understood exactly what he was saying. It's, it's a shocking, devastating assault on Jewish theology. Their theology had deviated from scripture, which they led as the Old Testament, but it was a well-developed system that they had created for themselves, and Jesus attacked their theology. He attacked their understanding of God. He attacked their understanding of the law. He attacked their understanding of righteousness. He attacked their perception of works and faith and grace. He attacked all of the elements of their theology. And then if that was not bad enough, that caused them to hate him. Then he claims to be God, which they see as the ultimate blasphemy. And that becomes the reason they want him dead. There are branches attached to him. They're all attached. All the branches are attached. But the ones that don't bear fruit are cut off. They're dried and they're burned. So who are they? Let me remind you of the context. This all begins back in chapter number 13 in the upper room. And it's pretty clear that there are two types of disciples in that upper room. Well, in John chapter 6, Jesus says, all that the Father gives to me, will I come to me and I lose none of them. This is not talking about believers, fruit bearing branches that all of a sudden are cut off and thrown into hell. This is talking about people who are attached, but there's no life because there's no fruit. Jesus had Judas had that very night, just a few hours before he walked away. From Jesus terminally, finally, he is what the Bible would call an apostate, an ultimate defector of the faith. He had been there for three years, close, so, so close that people didn't even know there was no life in Judas. Judas now was on his way to the leaders of Israel to set up the deal to arrest Jesus to get his 30 pieces of silver and to go from there to hang himself and to catapult himself into an eternal damnation. This is the reality of that night and this has to be what's behind our Lord's thinking and speaking here. He needs to explain to these men Judas. Wouldn't it seem natural to you that in, that in this intimate talk with the beloved 11 that are still with him, 
that they're all still trying to process what Judas has just done. He was high profile. He was the one that carried the money bag. Trusted. They were trying to figure out just how did that happen? Who is he? How did this fit? What's going on? And our Lord gives us an explanation. He says, there are branches that have an outward appearance of attachment, but they bear no fruit. I said, he said, there are branches that have an outward appearance of attachment, but they are bearing no fruit. They look the part, they talk the part, but they are not bearing any fruit. They're taking away and they're burned. And he has to be thinking of Judas. Judas, who was in close connection to him, has left on his way to an eternal damnation. And in fact, the Bible says he went to his own place. Yeah. It says it would have been better for him had he never been born, according to Mark chapter 14. And, and there, there was a corrupted vine. There was a, a degenerate vine. There was a fruitless vine. There was a, a, a empty vine. Who? Israel. That's right. The covenant people of God, the Jewish people, Israel, and God's vine is the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 5, Israel is presented as a vine. God says, I planted my vine, my vineyard, in a very fertile hill. According to Isaiah chapter 5. And that chapter, verses 1 through 7, goes on to talk about everything God did to give them all that was necessary for them to bring forth grapes. They produce bushim, which is a sour berry, something that is indesirable, something that is useless. Israel was divine, and that metaphor carried through the history of Israel during the Maccabean period between the Old and the New Testament. The Maccabeans, their minted coins, and on the coin was a vine that illustrated Israel. And on the very temple, Herod's massive temple, there was a great vine that literally had been carved and overlaid with gold, speaking of Israel as God's vine. God's life flows through that nation. There was, that, that was a symbol of Israel. There, there's much in the Old Testament. Psalms chapter 80. Sometimes you can read Psalms chapter 80 in its fullness, but Psalms 80 tells us the tragedy of Israel's defection as a vine. God planted Israel and then turned around on Israel in judgment. Psalms 80 then says, O God of hosts, turn again now, we beseech you, Look down from heaven and see and take care of this vine. Even the shoot from which your right hand has planted. It is burned with fire. It is cut down. Yeah, that's, that's, that's Israel. That, that's Israel. Ezekiel said it. It was an empty vine. That it had no fruit. Isaiah said that it produces a sort of a toxic, a useless, and an inedible resource. Israel had been the stock of blessings. Israel had been planted by God. His life would come through Israel to all who attached to Israel. But Israel was unfaithful. They were idolatrous. They were immoral. And God brought down judgment. That's what the Old Testament lays out for us. The disciples, like all other Jews, thought, huh, I'm Jewish. I'm connected to God. Israel, the people of God, the Jewish people, and the source of divine blessing. I am a Jew. I was born a Jew. I am the seed of Abraham. I am connected to God. Not so. Our Lord comes along and says, if you want to be connected to God, if you want to be an heir to the promise, I'm connected to God. He said, I'm not, not 
only do you have to be connected, you just have to be a Jew, you got to be connected to God. I am the vine, all phenos. I am the true vine. I am the perfect vine. Through me, the life of God flows. Matthew chapter 7 in my clothes. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. He said that you'll know them by the fruit that they bear. And that's repeated a number of times in the gospel. Paul in Romans chapter 6 says, you were slaves to sin. And now in Christ, you become slaves of righteousness. We are known by our fruit. We are known by the manifest evidence of transformation in our life. That's why the only way you can tell that a person is a child of God, not by remembering an event, not by remembering a prayer, not by wishing and hoping. The way you know someone has been transformed. And regenerated and born again is because the fruit of righteousness yeah. is manifested in their life. Yes. Yes. Right. It's, it's not perfection. Mm -hmm. Thank God it ain't got to be perfection because I'd be messed up. It's not because of perfection, but it is a dominating direction. Yeah. Yeah. There are people yeah. who attach to Christ and are fruitless. Mm -hmm. Saints, that's why I'm, I thank God that I know the vine. I'm so thankful tonight that I know the van. Not only am I thankful that I, 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 I know the van, but I thank God that I'm connected to the van. I'm glad that I can trace back this van. This van was not just something that came up as of late. It wasn't something that was thought up within the conceptualization of our ideologies and our preconceived notions, but it goes back way before the beginning of time. In Genesis, he was the van. In Genesis, he said he told them I am the word of God creating in the heavens and the earth in Exodus he said I was the Passover lamb whose blood was sprinkled on the doorpost of your heart so that you could escape the bondage of slavery in Leviticus he said I was the temple the place the holy place that you go to meet God in numbers he said I was your present God a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night over there in Deuteronomy he said I was the coming prophet that would be greater than Moses. In Joshua, he said, I was the conquering warrior that would lead you safely into the promised land. In Judges, he said, I was the unlikely savior who would rise from weakness in order to rescue you. In Luke, in Ruth, he said, I was your redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, I was your shepherd king who rushed out the east of giants all by myself. In First and Second King, I was your righteous ruler. In First and Second Chronicle, I was the restorer of the kingdom. In Ezra, I was your faithful scribe. In Nehemiah I was the rebuilder of the wall. In Esther I was your advocate in the throne room risking my life to save yours. In Job I was your living redeemer. In the song I was the one that heard your cry. In the Proverbs I was wisdom personified. In the song of Solomon I was your lover and your bridegroom. In Isaiah I was the son that would be born who would be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, the everlasting father. In Jeremiah I was the spirit that writes God's laws on your heart. In Lamentation, I was the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, I was the river of light bringing healing to the nation. In Daniel, I was the fourth man in the fire. In Hosea, I was the ever faithful husband who was pursuing her ever unfaithful bride. In Job, I was the restorer of the locusts had eaten. In Amos, I was your burden bearer. In Obadiah, I was judge over all the earth. In Jonah, I was the prophet cast out into the store so that you could be brought in. And Micah, I was the everlasting ruler that would be born in Bethlehem. And Nahum, I was the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, I was your reason to rejoice even when your fields were empty. In Zephaniah, I was the great reformer. In Haggai, I was the cleansing fountain. In Zechariah, I was a pure son whom every eye on earth would one day behold. And in Malachi, I was the son of righteousness, rising with healing in his wings. Yes. I thank God that I'm connected to the vine. Yes, sir. I Amen. thank God. 
that I am connected to the source. I'm so glad that I don't have to worry about where my power source is coming from because the power source now abides on the inside of me. He is the vine and I am the bread. As long as I stay connected to my father, as long as I stay connected to the vine, I will have everything that I need. I shall want for nothing because I am connected to the vine. When man is not working right, check your connection. It's not coming through, check your connection. It is not working out the way that I feel like it ought to work out. You need to check your connection. Because there are a lot of us that have the outward appearance of attachment. But we are bearing no fruit. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And any vine, any tree that does not bear fruit is good for nothing but to be cast down. Yes. Jesus said, I am the vine. He is the source of our life. He is the source of everything that we stand in need of. And especially in a day and an hour, in a time as such we live, you need to be connected. You, you, you need to hook up tonight. You need to be connected to Jesus Christ. I would have you to know, beloved, that this very world that we live in now will not last forever. These very streets that we walk now, one day will cease to be. One day we must sojourn, leave from this place and go to the next. And we must face a divine creator. We must face a God who before you were ever formed in your mother's womb, he knew everything about you. Every day of your life, he's watching you. He's guiding you. He's protecting you. One day, you got to stand before him and you got to meet him for yourself. Beloved, now we're worried. Now we're anxious. Now we don't know because it seems like, man, we got COVID-19. Man, we got social injustice, though it's been around. Man, we got this going on. And I got this going on in my personal life. Why are things not working out? But I can tell you, as I know for myself, even as a child of God, you can experience an all kind of hell in your life going through all kinds of problems. But as long as you stay connected to the soil, you are going to be all right. As long as as you stay connected to the master you are one for nothing as long as you stay hooked up to Jesus Christ you will be able to say like David said I've been young now I'm old yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken neither his seed begging for bread you need to get connected tonight you need to get the hook up tonight. You need to get plugged in tonight to Jesus Christ. My brother, my sister, if you're watching right now and you don't know the Lord and the pardon of your sins, you have not yet had your sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb. If you stand a guilty distance away from the Lord on tonight, I want you to come in just right now in your comments on the comments and say, hey, preacher, I need Jesus. Preacher, I'm standing in the need of salvation. Preacher, my soul needs to be saved. I would ask that you come and message us. We will get in connection with you tonight to make sure that your soul gets right with, Lord, with the Lord. If I die and my soul be lost, it ain't nobody's fault but mine. So you can come tonight. You can come to Jesus wherever you are. You, you, even though you're not here in the building, you can still come to him. We'll make sure that you can come to him. The Bible lets us know according to the, the book of Romans chapter 4 and verse number 17. It says that faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That lets us know that it is after one that has heard the gospel. After one has heard the word of God. It is then that faith is culminated in the life of the believer. Having faith in God causes you to want to obey God. Having faith in God causes you to want to follow his precepts. Causes you to want to follow his rule. Causes you to want to follow his guidance. And you can follow him all the way to the water. Have your sins washed away. Be washed away by the blood of the Lamb. Be buried with him in the watery grave of baptism. And the Lord himself, according to Acts chapter 2 and verse number 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord himself adds to the church daily 
such as should be saved. So my brother, my sister, whoever you are, wherever you are, you can come tonight. You can come to Jesus if you're standing in the need of prayer. If you need somebody to pray for you, come in and let us know what you're standing in the need of. The vine is ready. You just need to get connected. You need to get connected tonight. So let us know. Let us know how we can help you. If you need salvation, let us know. If you're standing in the need of prayer, let us know how we can help you.